Isaiah chapter 46 and 47 this evening. The idols of Babylon. Now you have to understand Babylon. Babylon was a mediocre nation. They were rising to power. They were growing strong, conquering little nations around them, bringing them in, you know, picking out the best of that nation and making them into soldiers and you know, assimilating them into their culture, their idolatry and, and so forth. And that's what they were doing with Israel. And they began to grow and grow and grow. And then they ended up fighting against the Assyrians. And Assyria was a great nation. And they would battle against the Assyrians, and the Assyrians battle against Babylon, and they go back and forth. It was just a battle like we have today with the United States and Russia. Two great nations that are constantly at battle, you know. They have their political battles, uh, their word battles, you know, and then their little battles uh, physically with one another. And so that's the type of nation Babylon and the Assyrians were. And Babylon was known for their idolatry. In fact, to this day, to this day, there are a lot of symbols that Babylon used that the church uses today. And I'm not talking about the, Catholic, or the Protestant church, I'm talking about the Catholic church. There are a lot of symbols that they use. For instance, the Pope, when he wears this hat, you know, and it's got this big old point on it and so forth. These are, these are symbols and garments that they used to uh, wear during the times of Babylon. And so there's a lot of tradition there uh, from Babylon itself. And of course... Uh, just our world, the fact of idolatry itself. What is idolatry? It's lifting anything up above God. Anything. It doesn't matter what it was. Paul defined it as covetousness is idolatry. You know what covetousness is, right? You see your neighbor driving down the street in a nice yellow Camaro with a black stripe on it, and you go, oh, I want one of those. That's covetousness. And you're always thinking about having your neighbor's car or your neighbor's wife, you know, or your neighbor's, you know, things. That is called covetousness because you're not content with what God has given you. You covet other things. Paul said that is idolatry. Now, why do I say that? Because it is serious. It is very serious for our Christian walk that we are not idol worshipers. And in this nation today, we are idol worshipers. Uh, we love American Idol, just the word itself. We're, we are so blinded to the fact that we will sit there and watch American Idol, and yet we're fine with Idol, you know, because we're not worshiping it, we're, we're not giving to it, we're not bowing down, we're not sacrificing, so we can't be worshiping idols, but in a sense we are, aren't we? I've watched the show, and there are times where you're listening to someone and you go, I wish I could sing like that. You know, if I could only sing like that, and you're coveting their gift of singing, you're coveting their gift of youth, you're coveting their lifestyle and so forth, you know, that's covetousness. And that's, that's an area that we really need to be careful that nothing comes before us and God. Because God wants a personal relationship with us. He really does. This Bible that I hold in my hand is the Word of God. Now, I know you might think, well, there's a lot of Bibles around. What about the Mormon Bible, the Jehovah Witness Bible? Uh, what about uh, those Bibles that are out there that Christian science use or Scientology? What about those Bibles? When you look at the Bible and where it originated from and the, all the documents that we have, the New King James Version is probably one of the most accurate of all of them. All of these other Bibles, like the Jehovah Witness New Transla World New Translation Bible, they have actually taken the Bible and then they have added some words here and there. And that's documented. It's, it, there's evidence. If you were to take that to court, you could prove that they've added to the Scriptures and they would be found guilty. Of course, they don't want to go to court. Uh, because they know that they're guilty. But they're, they think that they're justifying it because it's bringing more clarity to the Scriptures, and it really isn't. It, it's really confusing people about the Scriptures. So why, why would God write this record for us? Because He wants us to understand who He is. This is really His story. History, it's His story and how He relates with people. In the very beginning, He created Adam and Eve. And he had this relationship with Adam and Eve. He walked in the garden with them. And then after they had sinned, he created uh, this great nation, Israel, through Abraham. And said, I'm going to bless you. Your seeds are going to be more numerous than the stars in the heavens. But I am going to work through you and that great nation. Twelve sons rose from him. And in those twelve sons, he raised up twelve tribes. And he created a relationship with these people. So that all the world around these people and their God would see the God that they serve, comparing Him, 
our God with the idols that other nations served. And they would see that our God, Israel's God, was a strong and mighty God. That there was no other gods like Him. Nor will there ever be any other gods like Him. Because our God answered prayer. Our God gave them victory. Now they thought their gods did, as Babylon here, uh, we'll see in a minute, paraded their idols around because they were rising to power. Now there's a certain amount of natural principles that take place in our world. God says that He reigns on the just and the unjust. You know, Good and bad happen to people. Uh, you can get a bad person who's wicked and evil, and you may know some of those, and they're blessed, and you're going, why are they blessed? They get away with everything. Why do they have so much? This isn't fair. Because we live in a world that God reigns on the just and the unjust. Uh, he's working everything out for a purpose. You know, things are allowed, you know, for reasons. And, and we saw that through Cyrus last week and how he raised up Cyrus, uh, will, will raise up Cyrus to judge Babylon on behalf of the children of Israel. And so God is working around. But he's got this relationship with Israel and he has a relationship with us today. And, and he is showing himself strong today on our behalf to let the world know that our God is real. We hinder him, though, because we're into idolatry. We hinder him because we put other things before him. And that is dangerous for us, and, it, and it's dangerous for Christianity. Because then it weakens the power of God to work in our lives. It really does. Uh, Paul talks about this in Corinthians. And he talks about uneven, unevenly yoked. And how a believer should not be with an unbeliever. How God does not have fellowship with a false God at all. How darkness has nothing to do with light. And he talks about this relationship uh, mentality that, that when you're in a relationship, you really have to be like-minded and in unity. Otherwise, it won't work. There will be destruction and corruption and so forth. And so when there are things between us and God, it just doesn't work. There's a wall. God's full power cannot be expressed through your life because there are idols in our lives. But we don't have idols. We don't worship statues, really. If you go to Mexico today, you will see them parading around the Virgin Mary. They will bring her out and put her on a pedestal with all kinds of flowers and wreaths and so forth, and they'll throw money and pin money and all over the place, and men will carry the scene, and they'll parade down the road, and everybody will be praying and singing, and, and they're worshiping this idol. We sure do do that today. Yeah, but we don't do that in America. <clears throat> yes, we do. Anything that we covet is idolatry. Anything that we put before God is idolatry. Uh, I read an article this week about sports and how sports is coming in between church functions and these uh, families. People are putting their sports before church. And so they so easily make the choice to participate in their children's lives playing baseball and soccer on Sunday morning, then to take them to church to be taught about God, to worship their God, to give to their God, and to participate in the kingdom of God. That's idolatry. Because sports is coming in between them and God. Because God has called us to worship at least on Sunday. At least on Sunday, if not on the other opportunities that we get in the church. But at least on Sunday, and yet we make the excuse. And what, how do we justify it? These are our kids, and, and we're teaching them values, and we need to be active in their lives. Yeah, they're your kids, and you need to teach them spiritual values, true moral values, and what it costs to separate yourself unto the Lord. I was, I was blessed um, to hear that one of our youth who was in, heavily involved in, in football, he made a choice to not participate in football this year because it, it gets in the way of the youth on Friday nights. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Because you and I know high school, you know, once you're out, it's a whole different life, you know. You only, you're only there for four years. And so his choice reflects his heart. You know, it was a commitment and it was a choice and he did it. See, that's the right choice to make. But people will worship their sports and their activities on Sunday morning, even their jobs, even their jobs, you know. Um, we need to put God first. Anything that comes before, between us and God is considered 
idolatry. And so, can these idols save us? Can your sports save you? You can go every Sunday morning to sports. Can it save you? No. It has no spiritual value whatsoever. You know, it's not going to get you to heaven. Well, but I'm good to my kids and I love them. Won't God let me in because of that? No. No, He won't. You know, it's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says only Jesus can do that. So look at verse uh, 1 here of chapter 46. Uh, Baal bows down, Nebo stoops. He's talking about these idols here. This is the name of idols. Their idols were on the beast and on the cattle. Your carriages were heavily loaded, a burden to the weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. Now the children of Israel are being carried away into captivity. Force relocation. They go into Israel as a nation. They're in Jerusalem. They and they capture them and they take their people away into captivity. Many times in chains and a lot of times with uh, nose piercings and just dragging them along as though they were animals. And so they're relocating them. Babylon was known for that. Take them out of their environment. Bring them to another environment. Let them be assimilated. Let them begin to worship idols uh, that we worship. And in this case, it was. Baal and Nebo, which were the names of these two false gods that they worship. Baal is um, a Babylonian form of the Canaanite god Baal, or Baal is another word. Uh, we're not quite sure how it's pronounced. It's a god of, of the storm and agriculture. And so they worship this god thinking that because it rained, because their crops grew, that it must be this God that's doing that. You know, and that's how they worship, worship things. Because God rained on the just and the unjust. God is just gracious. You know, um, <clears throat> they contributed to a specific God. They made an island. They began to worship it. And as long as they worshiped it, offered food and money and sacrifice, then it will continue to rain. And you know that. That's how they believed. Um, another name was um, Nebo. He was Baal's son, a god of learning, and is found in the name of Neb, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebo, so lifting up of man, and also Belshazzar, Baal, kind of like the Baal god. Um, it's interesting because these gods are fashioned after great men. And ultimately that's what happens, is that we fashion our gods after men. And if it's not after a man, an American idol, if I could only sing like him, if it's not like uh, Janet Jackson, or if it's not like Beyonce, you know, if it's not, if I can't look like her, and if I can't dance like her, then something's wrong, you know, with me, you know, and, and we fashion our idols after men. And if we don't do that, and God forbid, I would never do that, but then we fashion our idols after ourselves, and we become our own gods. And that's, that's where we get the phrase, you know, I make my destiny. I choose where I want to go. Really? Really? Do you really? No, you don't. How many dreams and, and, and visions did you have of doing certain things and how many of those things really came true? I, I, I wanted to be an architect. Instead, I'm teaching behind a pulpit. <laughs> you know? uh, I wanted to you know, be heavily involved in sports and now I can't even jump because of this injury. You know, there's not a lot. Now, you do have men, obviously. There are people that, that have dreams and they go all out, but they're stepping over people. They're doing whatever they can because they're going to make that million dollars no matter what. You know, and they're doing it in the wrong way and not in the right way. I remember watching a program, even Christians have idols, this program, uh, I'm not going to tell you the race, but this individual was talking about Adam and Eve, the mark of Cain and Abel, and this individual said, you know what, God is not who we think he is on that cross. He says he's a totally different person than what we think. This, his whole tradition, this custom, this, this thing that has been passed on from generation has been totally wrong. And, and then he brings out a cross. And, he, and Jesus that was on this cross was in his own image. This is a, a, a minister on TBN and he's showing this Christ on cross and it was him himself on the cross his own picture, and his own nationality. You know, that's idolatry, completely. In fact, the wealth and faith doctrine, when you go back and trace it back, many of them will say, I am God. And many of them will even say, and I remember it was Kenneth Copeland or Hagen, one of them said, if I lived at that time, I would have died for the sins of the world. You know, that's idolatry to extreme. 
But that's how we get so confused and deceived by the enemy as though we have the ability to control our destiny in our lives. We don't. That's all up to God. All up to God. Now in contrast, listen, look at verse 3. It is God who listens. Listen to me, O house of Jacob. Jacob is Israel, the, his people, and all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb. In other words, I have been your caregiver all the way from birth until now. I have watched over you. I have taken care of you. I have provided for you. I have always been there for you. How many could attest to that? That God has always been there for you. How many close calls have you had in life? Even before you were a Christian and you said, wow, someone was watching over me. There was an angel there. You know, or there was God there. And I don't understand it, but God was definitely there. I mean, I had a lot of those experiences growing up. You know, and then even in Christianity. Because God is our character. He's alive, He's living, and He is the one that takes care of us. We need to believe that. We really need to believe that. I find myself not believing that, having disbelief that God can take care of us. Because it's easy to read it here. It's easy to see it as you watch the children of Israel you know, unfold into this great nation, how God rains manna down from heaven, provides quail, hits a rock, water comes forth, and you go, wow, those are great stories. Does he still do that today? I think he does. I think he does. He did it in our great nation. He provided for this great nation many, many times. When the enemy would come in and they would want to destroy this great nation, God gave them strength and power and raised up a righteous man, a righteous nation to battle against the tyranny of another government that wanted to come in and set up its own church, its own kingdom. And yet we stood on the biblical principles of God as a nation and we fought against that tyranny and we won because God was with us. And our founding fathers knew that. They knew it was because of God. And that's why that national monument with, the, with uh, uh, that lady of faith pointing to the sky. It's God, it's God, it's God. It's always God. And as soon as we remove God, what do we have? What do we really have? Why are other nations in this world, why do their nations fail? Why did Russia collapse? Why is Iran in trouble? Why is Egypt all, you know, all over the place? Because God is not their foundation. It is man. And when you come up with the rules, if, when you come up with the ideas, when you come up with the values and, the, and what is moral and not moral, like we, we do today, you know, you know, it's moral to be married and being the same sex. That's fine. What's the big deal? That's okay. That's man's idea of morality. That's not God's idea. When you begin to make up those rules, guess what? You're building on sinking sand because it won't last. It won't last. Obama right now is pushing. He is pushing for, um, <clears throat> what do they call it when they call a state of an emergency? Martial law. Martial law. He's talking about martial law right now. Uh, he has the ability to just say at any moment now as a president, for any reason, for financial reasons, for uh, the enemy coming and attacking reasons, for this terrorist, terrorist uh, possibilities that may be attacking, he can claim martial law. And when he does that, he is in total control. He has control of everything. From what I understand, he has control of the secular world and the government. He got, becomes the last say in everything because everything needs to be focused on what is taking place to this nation. All resources need to come to protect this great nation, otherwise we're destroyed. So then he becomes the sole leader, dictator of our world. He is building it on this type of social uh, communist system. It doesn't work. Because eventually what we're going to see is we're going to see him rise to power. We're going to see him rise with wealth. And we're going to see him begin to make the rules. And, and right now they're pushing for, I think it's in, in New York, for abortion to be allowed all the way up to nine months now. All the way to nine months. Because it's still in the womb. It's, it's not a baby. They're making up the rules. God says it's a baby from the time of conception. And you don't touch it. Those are God's moral rules and values, and they work. How do we know that, that God's system works? Because look at our nation. It's the greatest nation in the world, and no other nation has ever been this great in the world. 
because it's all founded on Christian values. See, our God is alive. He cares about us, and He's active in the lives of His people. And He wants to carry us. He wants to carry us. It's all, he has this desire to carry us. He has this desire to work in us and through us, to show Himself on our behalf, to show the world and those around you that He really does work and He's alive. I was sharing with someone uh, the other day, it just happened to fit in there, my son Moses, when he was a little kid, he had this big sore in his mouth, and he was just crying, crying, couldn't shut him up. <clears throat> no matter what I said, he just kept crying and crying and crying and crying, and then finally they were like, well, let's pray, Dad, and we used to have our little meetings, open up our Bible, and we'd do our devotions and pray and so forth, and they're like, let's pray, and it's my lack of belief, and I said, all right, we'll pray, and I'm like, like it's going to do anything. And so Virginia led, and I prayed, and kind of reluctantly I prayed. And then all of a sudden, he just stopped crying. And we just looked, I mean, immediately after we prayed, amen in Jesus' name, and boom, he stopped crying. And we're like, okay. He goes, yeah, it doesn't hurt anymore. I mean, it was still there. It was red, it was blistery, it was this really sore looking. And, and he starts biting it, see? And he's biting it like, yeah, it doesn't hurt me at all. Um, and we're all just sitting there going, wow. Before our very eyes, God did a little miracle for us. You know? And I think that's one of the reasons that, that my family is, is so strong in their faith in Christianity because they've seen those little miracles when God does work, when we decide to say, Lord, I, I, I want you in our lives, and, but you better be real. You, know? you better be real. And if you're real, you understand my heart and my hesitance here. And so if you're real and a real person, a real God, then I know you're going to work. I knew I remember when I first got saved and started reading the Bible. And I would uh, tell myself, this, these are amazing stories. This is amazing stuff. And I said, if you are real, I'm going to see some things that I'm, I would never believe before. I would never believe. And I have. You know, that's why you can never beat me to death and uh, Christ out of me. You, know, you can't beat Christ out of me because I know that he's real and he's alive you know, and he's active. Yeah, I get down. Yeah, it's hard. Toilets finances, you know, numbers, all these things like, Lord, come on. You know, but I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. You know, the water might be going up to here, you know, and then it's up here. I'm going to find a crack in the rock, and I'm going to suck that little air bubble that's there just to keep surviving, you know, whatever God has, whichever way, because he's alive and because he cares for us. Peter said, cast all your anxieties or your cares upon him because he cares about you. He cares about you. If nobody else cares about you, he cares about you. Your wife doesn't care about you. Your husband doesn't care about you. Your feelings, your opinions, what you like, what you'd like to see, what you enjoy, God does. He cares about you completely. You know, if your neighbor, your friends, your family, your mom, your brothers, they don't, no one can care as much as God cares about you. He gives you life itself. That's how much He cares about you. you know, he, he's watching over you constantly. So you can cast your cares on Him because He does care for you. In fact, Peter quotes from Psalms 55, Cast thy burdens upon the Lord and He shall sustain thee. You know, he knew the Old Testament. Isaiah 63, we'll see this later on, says he bore them and carried them. God literally bore them and carried them through life. And so God cares. Even to your old age, he said, I am he. And even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I, may, I have made, I will bear, I will, eat, I will carry, and I will deliver you. Those are promises to Israel. Again, you look at Israel and you see God's hand working in the children. There's another evidence to the scriptures being true. No other nation has survived what Israel has survived. Six million Jews killed during the Holocaust. That's just the Holocaust. Another, other hundreds of thousands that were killed by Russians because of them living and dwelling in Russia in certain areas. They have been massacred and killed and pointed out. Even to this day, there is a prejudice towards Israel. There's a hatred for them. I remember growing up that that was one of the prejudices of my family was Israel. The Jews, they own everything. They own all the banks. They own all the institutions. They're the problem, you know, and I would hear this all the time. It didn't make any sense to me. I didn't even know who the Jews were as, as a kid. But now it makes sense to me because these are God's people. And the enemy hates them. 
And we're going to see this continue to happen in the world today. But yet God says, I will carry them. I will bear them. I will deliver them. And he has. He has. There were many nations during their time. The Hittites, the Amorites, Jebusites. Um, Where are those nations today? Have you ever heard of a Jebusite? What's your nationality, Jebusite? I'm Mexican. What are you? I'm a Hittite. You know? Hittite? What's a Hittite? There are none because they're all gone. Because they all attacked the children of Israel. And yet, you will hear of an Israelite to this day. And they have their own nation again. And God is going to continue to deal with them again because he loves them so much. As he loves us and will carry us. So, how can we compare God to other idols? You just can't, can you? And we know that. We know how powerful our God is. Wouldn't it be ridiculous to pray to an idol? Who would you pray to, an idol or would would you pray to God? We'd all go to God, obviously. Who do people go to? The bottle. Well, let's just go to the bottle. Maybe that will take it away. If I get drunk enough, I'll forget about it, you know, and maybe it'll be gone. Well, at least for the night, along with everything else that you ate. (laughs) But it's back in the morning because the bottle won't really help you. You only let you escape for a day or hours, and some people months because they're in the bottle every day trying to escape life. Now we go to God, and if we only understood this, we would go to Him even more because He has all the answers. How can we compare Him? And this is what He says in verse five: "To whom will you liken me, and make me equal, and compare me to? And who can you compare God to? Create the heavens and the earth. There's nobody like Him." That we should be alike. They lavish gold out of the bag. They weigh silver on the, on the scales. They hire a goldsmith and he makes it a god. They prostrate themselves. Yes, they worship. They bear it on their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in their little places. It's the little stands. From its place it shall not move. The one carries it, yet it cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. And they used to do that. They'd have their little idols and they'd hire somebody and they give them gold and they make them and they put them in their pockets. You know, they put them in their pockets. I would tell that to my, my girls when they were little babies um, growing up. My granddaughters, I have all granddaughters uh, except Weddle. But I would tell them, I want to carry you in my pocket. I just want to carry you in my little pocket and take you everywhere I'm at so you're with me all the time because um, Angelina is just such a tiny little girl and she was even tinier when she was small, so I'd always tell her, I'm like, put you in my pocket. And then I'd get their foot and literally put it in my pocket, and i like, get in there! You know, That's what they did with these idols. They literally carried them. And then they would pull them out and say, would you help me? Would you give me victory? Would you take care of me? And then they put them back in. They couldn't even walk themselves. Can you just walk by yourself? Come on, let's go. I'm not going to do anything. That's God's point here. It's, it's ridiculous to... Compare them with the true and living God. Remember this and show yourselves, men. Recall to mind, O you transgressors. It's a sin to be in idolatry. Transgression means sin, but it's willful sin. You know what you're doing. And yet we continue to do it. Remember the former things of old. And for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the ends from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. He's saying, remember. Now, he's writing this through Isaiah. Isaiah's telling Israel this is going to happen, and so he's reminding them, now when this happens, remember me, so you know that I am a God that even knows the future. And he's going to talk about Cyrus again, and how later on he's going to come and deliver you from the hand of, of Babylon. And remember me that I'm a real God. I'm not an idol. They can't walk or see or even answer you. Calling a bird of prey from the east. Now there's Cyrus. He's talking about Cyrus. He's a bird of prey from the east. The man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. And so he's going to use him. He's going to be his spokesman. He's going to literally use this ungodly king for his task and for his work. He says, listen to me, you stubborn-hearted, you who are far from righteousness. <sighs> Don't get to the point where you're stubborn-hearted. Keep your hearts 
open to God at all times. Be honest with Him as believers especially, knowing that He already knows your heart. Whatever struggles and pains that you have, whatever sin is in your life, be honest with Him. Don't try to hide it. Don't ignore it. Thinking that, okay, if I don't think about it, if I don't confess it, then God doesn't know it. He knows it. Because it's only going to fester up in you and hurt you. And He's calling you stubborn because you're not willing to confess it to Him. You don't have to confess it to no one else. That's none of their business. This is between you and God. He's your God and you are His child. And your struggles are His struggles. Your cares are His cares and He wants to carry them for you. And so you open yourself up to Him with everything. Don't hide any rooms in your heart. Be open. And when you sin, just say, God, you know I struggle with this sin. I'm, I'm constantly struggling. You're God. Help me with this, Lord. I need your help. I need victory. I need power. I'm not going to hide it from you. You know I keep falling into this. And so I just continually need your grace and your mercy to flow in me because I am weak here and I need your strength. And you have to just constantly give it to Him. But don't hide it because then you become stubborn and heart-hearted. Uh, pride is, is one of the... Uh, the worst sins of all, pride. I know what I'm doing. I got the answer. I'll take care of it myself. Everybody else is the problem, you know. Be honest with the Lord because He knows. I bring my righteousness, righteousness near against Cyrus. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. Salvation, speaking of God's deliverance for the children of Israel. Uh, for us today, our salvation is in who? Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. It's the name of Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus, he told the disciples, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. You can get to the Father no other way but through me. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus was praying with sweats of blood, crying out to the Father, if there's another cup, take it from me, Lord. Take it from me and do it another way. But not my will. Your will be done. And the Father said, you are the cup and you need to go to the cross. Because there was no other way. There was no other possibility. If only Peter would be better, Lord, Take that sacrifice. If, if only the disciples did what I said, Lord, do I have to go to... No, they can't do it. You have to do it. You know, none of us can do it. It's only in the name of Jesus that our salvation comes. We need to understand that. It's so important that we're not confused with uh, all these other religions that are out there. Now, God's judgment comes upon Babylon and the Chaldeans here in chapter 47 as he deals with them. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall be, or you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstone and grind meal. Remove your veil. Take off your skirt. Uncover the thigh. Pass through the river. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame will be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not arbitrate with a man. In other words, you're going to be judged. And I will judge you. And you will know that it's me that judges you. Now notice that Isaiah here refers to Babylon as a female. As a female here. Why a female? There's a reason for that. Because of a female being humbled in a sense. Not necessarily a man being humbled, but a female having really no power, no strength whatsoever and being humbled like the female. When we go to Revelation, you're going to see Babylon uh, and uh and the uh, dragon is, is in the woman, kind of like a, a female also. And God's going to humble them, strip them of everything that they have, speaking of their weakness. Not saying that women are not equal to men. I'm not saying that. But God is referring to the fact that women are, are not equal, but weaker than men are. There are just some things they just can't do. That's that sign of weakness. Physically and so forth. Not mentally, because there are smart women out there. A lot smarter than men, too. So, got to give them that. God has used them in a, in a mightily way. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is His name. The Holy One of Israel. Well, who's our Redeemer? The Lord of hosts. The Holy One of Israel. 
That is, again, Jesus Christ. Uh, a redeemer was that Goel, that close relative that would come in and redeem you. You were sold into slavery, a, re- a relative would come in and help you. You know, we do that today. We help our relatives. We're redeemers in a sense. Uh, they're down and out. We pick them up. We house them. We feed them. We help them find a job. We're in a sense, we're redeeming them. You know, uh, They could literally die, give up hope, and we come in and we like redeem them in a sense. And so this redeemer idea of them coming in. And the redeemers had to be uh, uh, certain characteristics. They, they had to be able to deliver you. They had the re- needed the resources. They needed the power, the authority, and so forth. They needed to be willing to battle because there were times where they got bloody, where they went in to redeem you and deliver you. And it meant costing them something too. And so oftentimes it would hurt them. If it was physical, then it would get bloody. Um, they would go in and they would set prisoners free. If they were captured in jail, pay the fines, get them out of jail. So a redeemer. Christ is our Redeemer. He is our God, Creator, not just our family. He is our Maker. And He bled on the cross to redeem us from the bondage of sin. Now, He didn't redeem us to give us freedom to do what we want. He redeemed us to be free from sin so that we wouldn't give ourselves to sin any longer, but give ourselves to righteousness for Him. You need to understand that. It's important that we understand that God didn't free us to continue to sin. He didn't free us so that we continue to do the dumb mistakes that we did in the past. He freed us so that we no longer uh, would have um, a willing heart to give in to those things. That we would not be shackled to those things. That we are free from sin and the bondage of sin. It's hold on us. That's important. I want to do a message on that one day because um, for myself and also just because I think there's a need there. Uh, We need to realize that we're not in bondage anymore to these things you know God has freed us from them and we need to really stand up how has he freed us how has he freed us to that and, and how do we obtain that power because you know we still fall into those things well be encouraged because Paul f- fell into those things too and you remember in, in Romans he said the things that I knew to do I found myself not doing them and the things yet I knew I shouldn't be doing I was doing them you know and he was just like oh wretched body of mine there's a flesh there's a nature in us that just desires these things and we have to stop feeding that nature. That's why we need to be in church more, praying more, studying more, reading more, uh, listening to Chuck Tapes more. You know, There's even apps. You can get K-Wave on an app and listen to K-Wave all day long on an app You know, and just being filled with the Spirit of God. He goes on and says, Sit in silence and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no longer be called the Lady of the Kingdom. I was angry with my people and I profaned my inheritance. And given them into your hands, you show them no mercy. On the elderly, you laid your yoke very heavily. Isn't that sad? They laid yokes upon the elderly. They forced them. They put them under this yoke of bondage, you know. And God was angry with them for doing, doing that thing, for putting their people in that bondage. Um, and he's going to correct them for doing such a thing. You know, Babylon thought that, <clears throat> that she conquered Judah because of their own power and strength, right? But it was God allowing them to take the children of Israel for correction. And yet Judah now, or I'm sorry, Babylon now that they have the people, they were putting this great burden and God was seen and saying, oh no, you can't do that to my kids. You know, I'm using you as an instrument to correct them so that hopefully they cry out to me and then when I hear them, I'll come back and restore them. But now you are going a little too far. You've drawn the line, and you've gone over it. You know you can't do that to my children. You're taking my older ladies, and you're putting these burdens on them. No, that's not going to continue to happen. You know, that's how much God loves us. He, he'll only allow the enemy to go so far. Job, consider him, Satan. Just don't touch him. You know, just consider him. Put boils on him. You know, but watch what he does. He will not deny me. So only so much. And you said, I shall be a lady forever. Now there's the pride. Forever. When you, when you think you're in control, and you have the power. You know, I, I love youth. I've been there. I thought I'd be healthy all my life. You know, hey, there's nothing I can do. I'll be running the rest of my life. And I've seen older men run all their lives. And then all of a sudden you come to the realization you can't run. You can't jump. I remember when the physical therapist said, okay, I want you to jump. 
And so I did like just one jumping jack, legs apart, then back end jump. She goes, how does that feel? I go, oh, that hurt. She goes, okay, don't do that no more. I haven't done it since. I have not jumped in years. Well, since that time. There, because jumping aggravates the joint in the hip, which uh, flares up the bursitis, and then it just swoll- gets swollen even more, and it just hurts. And so I have this kind of a type of fibromyalgia that's taking place there. You know, and you realize, I can't do that anymore. I used to think I would be able to do it for the rest of my life. And we know that as we get older. You know, and here they are. I'm going to be a lady forever. I'm going to be a great nation forever. I'm going to be young forever. I'll be able to do this forever. No, you won't. Because your life can be taken like that. You know, Javier had a situation in his life just recently. Went up to a panel and just flashed. You know, and it literally went in him. And he's telling me the story that there's a possibility that he was actually laying on the ground for a while. Just didn't realize that when you're unconscious and you wake up, it doesn't seem like it's very long. You know, because it stops some of his heart. There's not, they're not, it's not sending signals. You know, so keep him in prayer. But, you know, we don't know. We don't know. Some of us do know. Like our brother um, Mario, you know, his lungs are failing. You know, Lonnie, you know, we're failing. We're, we can't do the things we used to do. You know, and we know that um, we're closer to going home. But some of us don't know it, and yet we're probably even closer than they are. At any moment, we could be gone. At any moment. I remember years ago when my son Simon, <clears throat> um, his wife's uh, sister, graduated high school. Graduated high school. And she ended up getting in an accident like not even a week after something like that uh, of graduating on the freeway. And it was gone just that quick. Devastating. It's like, wow. Right out of high school. And it's sad. It's sad to see a life wasted like that. And we, we just don't know. And so this this idea of, of I'm going to sell next week and, and I'm going to store here and I'm going to do that. That's why James says, don't do that. You don't know what tomorrow even brings. Just trust in the Lord today. So that you did not take these things to heart nor remember the latter end of them. Therefore hear this now, you who are given to pleasures who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the lost of my children. So you see their pride? Oh, my pleasures, I am, who are you? And they put themselves in the place of God. But these two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorcery. For the great abundance of your enchantments. Now sorcery, they were into sorcery. Witchcraft. Now sorcery, when you look in the New Testament, it talks about sorcery being one of those works of the flesh. Sorcery is where we get our word pharmakia, pharmacy, or pharmaceutical. Um, It's where we get the, um, the word drug. It's talking about drugs. When you take drugs, when you participate in that whole drug system of of causing you to have illusions and visions and feeling, you know, these sensations, that's the same thing that was happening here. It's sorcery. Because you're putting yourself in a different state of mind and you're opening your, yourself up to satanic activity in your life. And so a lot of times these, these people take drugs for that, to get into the satanic situation. We are seeing a lot of that in the entertainment business right now. A lot of tied to the Illuminati. Now whether they're doing it purposely... You know, or they're doing it because they're sensationalizing it. But you're seeing a lot of these artists, rappers, using gangster uh, signs or using uh, religious symbols, satanic symbols and things. Then they're taking drugs and they're getting into hallucinations. It's sorcery. It's all sorcery. And, and it's part of pride because it's, they're putting that before God. And God's going to judge them because it won't last. For you have trusted in your wickedness. You have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge has warped you, and you have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. And so again, there, there's that uh, pride and, and them putting themselves before, before God. Idolatry. Three times, 
the word pride is seen in Scripture. Proverbs 3.34, Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The opposite of pride. We need to humble ourselves. What does that mean to humble ourselves? To think more highly of others than we think of ourselves. Uh, I have a relative that's on Facebook. This is a perfect example of humbling yourself. Even, even if you're right, even if you're right, Humbling yourself is, the, is really the best avenue to take. This was just a blessing and a testimony of her faith in Christ. She took her family out to dinner. And all her kids were there sitting there and they were enjoying dinner. And there was a family next to them and they were cussing up a storm. Drinking and just cussing up a storm. To where the kids were literally looking over there and listening to them. And so she was really feeling bad. Like, oh, we need to leave. We need to, they shouldn't be doing that. This is wrong. And she was getting a little upset. And then all of a sudden the Lord just kept touching her heart you need to talk to him you need to talk to him you need to talk to him and so I, you know i'm reading the story as she's writing and i'm thinking she's going to really say something to them you know about this what, what kind of people are you you shouldn't be cussing and swearing in a restaurant like that and so finally she just kept pushing it down and finally the lord says you need to do it so she leans over and says excuse me can i talk to you and the lady says yes ma'am sure and she says to her you were worth it and the lady goes, what? She says, you were worth it. You're worth it. And she explained, Christ died on the cross for you, and you were worth it. And the lady just like, wow, thank you. It just changed her whole attitude, you know, her whole attitude. She could have approached her with a lot of different words, but she approached her with the truth. God loves you. He died on the cross for you. You were worth it. He values you. Even though you don't value yourself, or others, he values you. You're worth it. And I thought, wow, what a blessing. What a perspective to have. That's humility. That's being humble in a situation. It's just redirecting it to Christ. I like that line. Next time I'm driving, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell all the people as I'm driving by them, you're worth it. You're worth it, and you're worth it, and you're all worth it. You just get out of my way, because you're worth it too. And <laughs> I, has, I struggle with drivers so much James says he who gives more grace therefore he says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble and then James 4 1 where do wars and fights come from among you do they not come from your desires for pleasure and war in your members you know pride pride just will destroy you in relationships I find that my relationship with my wife is all about pride wanting my way even if it's the right way, <laughs> you know, and, and you just have to eat crow a lot, and you just have to say, okay, whatever, and I'm learning that, it's just, whatever, go ahead. Raul Reese was talking about uh, his wife this morning, or Tuesday morning, and how they do separate things, and, and he was saying, he goes, I just leave my wife alone, I just leave my wife alone, just let her do her ministry, she's involved in that, you know, and um, I do my ministry, and that's fine, and we just... Stay focused on the Lord, you know, and our relationship is, is fine as long as we're staying focused on the Lord. You know, it's hard. Relationships are hard. And he was a lot more honest, uh, honest uh, than what I just shared with you, but I don't want to share it on tape. Um, they are hard. Personally speaking, it, it's, it's difficult living with my wife. No, I mean her living with me. It's difficult her living with me. You know, it's very difficult, um, and I think any relationship is. I was telling Javier this morning that when I got into the ministry um, years ago and started really serving the Lord, we would drive to church together. And she'd have all the kids in the car and she would literally park out by the, the um, entrance into the church and she's honking her horn. Get going, let's go, let's go. You know, I don't know if the kids remember that or not. And I'm like, what is she doing? I'm trying to clean up and close things down. I'm serving God. And so I run out there. I go, what are you doing? She goes, we got to go. We got this way. I'm like, you know what? Go. I'll, wa I'll walk home. Just leave me here. I'm serving God. Don't be honking your horn, you know, at me and stuff. And so that, from that point on, I decide, you know what? You drive your car and I'm going to drive my car. You know? and, and then you can take off whenever you want and I can continue to serve the Lord. Because I just loved serving the Lord. I didn't even want that to stop me. And so just, you know, and I understood her. She had things to do. The kids were all in there and, and so forth. I'm not saying that she was wrong at all. I'm just saying that it's, relationships are difficult and there has to be a give and take. But more than anything, there has to be humility where you just say it doesn't matter. 
because God's going to judge me on how I handled this situation, you know, on how I respected my husband and my wife in that relationship. And, and it's only for a season because then I'll spend eternity without them. I mean, not without them, <laughs> but in heaven, perfectly loving them and them perfectly loving me. And I'm talking eternity, forever and ever and ever, and that a couple of evers on that, and on top of that ever. You know, I mean, it'll, it'll be fine then. So for us to endure now, humbling ourselves through these situations in our relationships is so important and it's vital, and that's what will keep your relationships strong. And you're not the only one that goes through those things. You're not the only one. A lot of people do, and you'll grow as you continue to stay faithful to God. So he says, Therefore evil shall come upon you, and you shall not know from where it rises. The trouble shall fall upon you, verse 11. You will not be able to pull it off, and desolation shall come upon you suddenly, which you shall not know. Stand now with your enchantments, and the multitude of your sorcerers or sorceries in which you have labored from your youth, perhaps you will be able to profit, perhaps you will be able to, to prevail. <laughs> so God's kind of just challenging them. Go ahead, try it, scream all you want. You know, I, that little picture of Shirley MacLaine, remember when she wrote a book on her being God, you know, and the guy was describing how she would go out into, uh, I think it's Nevada, and there's a point of, uh, of, there's a point on the earth that's probably the most spiritual point they suggest. So she'll go there and she'll just scream out, I am God. I am God. And she says, you need to do this to remind yourself that you're God and you're in control of your destiny. You are God. So just stand out there and scream out loud, I am God, you know. And so this is a great selling book. And so the guy that was uh, discussing this said, can you imagine being God? And then being way up in heaven... And you're on your throne and all these angels are around and you have the cherubim and so forth. And all of a sudden you're hearing this little noise and you go, what is, what's that? <laughs> what's that noise? And the angels, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, well, I hear it. I hear it. And then all of a sudden the angels and God look down and you, you see a little speck and it's like, I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. <laughs> you know, it's like from God's perspective, you're an ant, you know. <laughs> what a perspective, you know. And then God's challenging them here, like, go ahead, call your sorceries, go ahead, call your soothsayers, go ahead, do what, it, cut yourselves, you know, do whatever you want, and let's see how you prevail. You won't prevail at all. You are wearied in the multitude of your counsel. Let now the astrologers, stargazers, and the monthly procrastinators or pro, prognosticators stand up and save you from all what shall come upon you. Behold... They shall be a stubble, and fire shall burn them. And as <clears throat> they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. Thus shall be they be to you with whom you have labored, your merchandise or merchants from your youth. They shall wander, each one to his quarters. No one shall save you. So a contrast from the last chapter, where God, I will deliver you, and now to Cyrus, or to Babylon and them, no one shall deliver you. No one shall deliver you. Uh, only one that can deliver us is the blood of Jesus. I encourage you to continue on uh, coming to church and reading the Bible and learning about God, because the more you do that, the more you're going to realize it makes sense. And if you haven't done it yet, I pray that you would call out to God and make him your God because he is real. He really is. Now, I say that, and I'm not rationalizing it in my own mind. The evidence is in the scripture. The evidence is in Israel. The evidence is in the things around you. Look at the world. Look at, the, look at nature. It's a canvas, and it speaks about a creator. The things that you see weren't just there. They didn't just appear. Someone created it. And that's the God that we serve.